As everyone knows, I am from Chicago. As JR likes to make fun of me for, I'm from Chicago. Now, the Bulls are near and dear to my heart. This past week, we did why the Chicago Bulls banned headbands, and now we turn to how they almost killed one of their own players. The main character in all of this, I know I joked about it before, but here he is, Luol Deng. Solid player for the Chicago Bulls for many, many, many years, 10 plus years. He's still getting paid because of how well he played with the Chicago Bulls. <laughs> Seriously, we'll get to that in a second. So the Telegraph put this out, and it says an estimated 4 million people have been displaced from Sudan, where the Wall Dang is from, due to wars that have blighted the country since it gained independence in 1956. Just allow Luol Deng to paint the picture for you as he did years back via Comcast Sportsnet Chicago. Bulls forward Luol Deng was growing up in southern Sudan, where civil war has killed more than 1.9 million people in his lifetime. Genocide surrounded him, but when the elected government was overthrown in 1989, Luol's father had to protect his children. Uh, he realized what was going on, so what he started to do was get, get us out of the country slowly. And, you know, he told the government that he was going on a vacation. You know, and he sent us all to Egypt first uh, to get out of the country. And then he decided to come over and meet us in Egypt. So there's a reason why Luol Deng fled the Sudan. As you just saw right there, and even as you're gonna see right here via ESPN. As a toddler in Sudan, Luol was taught to seek cover under his bed at the sound of gunfire. As a kid. <clears throat> And I don't wanna make this about Luol Deng's history, I just want you to understand it before we jump into him being in the NBA. Then when Luol Deng was nine, the family were granted political asylum in England, settled in South Norwood into a house that Deng still calls home. He became a naturalized British citizen in October 2006 in a ceremony. So this is very, very important because later on he would wanna play for the English national team. Let's jump though to when, in high school, by the way, this is another story for itself, played with Charlie Villanueva. No. <laughs> yeah, very surprising. <laughs> so, jumping to college, Luol Deng went to Duke, as you're gonna see right here via the Courier Journal. He was fantastic, by the way, in that one season. And via the Atlanta Constitution, he was ruled one of the top newcomers in all of college basketball. One name that's familiar on there? No, it's not Chris Paul, it's not who? It's Von Wafer. Remember Von Wafer? Yeah, again, a name you only remember once it's in front of you again. Like, totally. Von Wafer. I got, I got a great one right now, by the way. Vander Blue from Marquette. That dude, anybody remember Vander Blue in the studio? No. And Vander Blue could ball. And then I have no idea what happened to him, <laughs> but I'm really hoping that he makes Maybe a comeback. Maybe he plays overseas or something. Yeah. Uh, he was actually drafted by the Lakers, I mm -hmm. believe, or made his way to the Lakers D-League team or something like that. However, continuing on, in June 2004, here's another name from the past. The Bulls are pleased with the pair. They added Luol Deng, seen right there, and Ben Gordon. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Number four overall pick in that draft as well. That was a well. squad, man. Uh, before Andre Iguodala, there was Ben Gordon and his biceps, by yeah. the way. So many people will remember, as JR just said, for the contract that he had, yeah. right? Here is what it was. Four years, $72 million. Now that was, what was that, 2016, 2014, 2015, something like that. Mm -hmm. So. Many people will remember him for that instead of remembering him for stuff like this when he was awesome with the Chicago Bulls. He only, I emphasize only, made two all-star game appearances. He was second team all defense. More importantly, he was the heart and soul of the Chicago Bulls. What do you remember about Luol Deng with the Bulls? Um, it, for some reason, it was something about the corner three-pointer. You know, like once he was sitting mm. in the corner, I was like, well, that's gone. Don't leave that open. It was, it was pretty, it was pretty oh. automatic, you know? Once he's in the corner, I was thinking that's just something you want to just kind of uh, avoid having. <laughs> Here is where there are going to be three humongous points that I believe, <clears throat> excuse me, manifested into the broken relationship that was with Luol Deng and the Chicago Bulls. The first is par for the course with any single athlete, which is the divide between what I believe I should be paid and what the team is willing to offer mm -hmm. me. We've seen this in sports a million and one times. <clears throat> it took years for Luol Deng to get his due. And just before, as we're gonna show you in a second, what he got, they were lowballing the crap out of Luol Deng, was the Bulls franchise. So then in 2008, 
I mean, Mark Stein wrote this and I love this title. At long last, Bulls announced signing of Dang to six year deal. Yeah, it was about bleeping time. Everyone knew that he was worth the money. However, the Bulls thought he was around like 40 to 50. He ended up getting about, getting about $80 million as you're gonna see on the very next page. Six year contract, <clears throat> excuse me, $80 million, which was huge at the time, yeah, right? Yeah, you're, you're creeping on the, well, not that close, I mean. 80 to 100 million, but still, it's starting to sound like it's close to the 100 million dollar range. And again, two time All Star. He wasn't like, um, again, he was a good player, but I don't think people were putting him at the superstar status. You know, he's playing in the air with the Kobe's and everybody. So those guys are the right. ones that are superstar statuses, you know, uh, LeBron James, all those guys in the league doing their thing. So Tim Duncan, those are the guys, right? right? Um, so he was like the second tier of star status. Very much so, yeah. but he was worth the money. Mm -hmm. All of Chicago agreed that he was worth the money. So here's the second part that is like, mm, there's a disconnect between the Bulls franchise and Luol Deng. Here's how it occurred. Against the Houston Rockets in Mar on March 1st, 2009, or at least around that time, Luol Deng could be lost for the season. This is the initial report with a stress fracture in his right tibia. X-rays on Dang showed a likely stress fracture of the right shin. By the way, ow. Yeah, Jesus. <laughs> Hurts like hell. So then he, four days later, this is via the Northwest Herald. This is the Bulls' team statement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Talk about just stabbing your player in the back here through the public, through the media. An early anterior tibial stress fracture. All the information to date points to some mild inflammation along his tibia with a small irregular... Irregular, come on, help me out here. Irregularity. Thank you. With <laughs> words are hard. Within the cortical bone, with no obvious break in the inner or outer layer of the bone, the course of treatment is called active rest. <laughs> Dang will be encouraged to challenge himself physically, and if symptoms remain minimal, he will be allowed an expeditious return to play. These decisions will be made on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, if you're a mild NBA fan, casual NBA fan. Even if you're an NBA fan who doesn't pay attention to the Bulls at that time, or even now to this day, if you hear something like, we're gonna encourage him to challenge himself physically, the course of treatment is active rest, you would think like, oh, Dang just doesn't wanna play. What you'd also think is that maybe that shin problem is shin splints. Have you experienced those before? Oh yeah, horrible. So, um, you experience those, I mean, I think it was when you first start running hard, like in high school when we're freshmen and sophomores in high school, and you first start running hard, you're on the cross-country team, you're on the track team, like, oh, man, coach, there's something wrong with the front of my legs. And you're like, oh, those are shin splints, youngster. Oh, man. You've never run hard before, have you? We're going to call for some active rest and for you to push through, and you'll be fine. That's the, that's the diagnosis for shin splints. Yeah. Not a fracture to the tibia. Right, exactly. Jesus. Yeah. So that's where. Yeah, stress fracture, but uh, the, the a term in the middle of that, uh, the word in the middle of that term, or the tail end of it, mm -hmm. is fracture. It also <laughs> feels like they're going in opposite directions uh -huh. and stepping over themselves. Active rest, pushing himself, challenging himself. Which one is it? Yeah. So we continue on. Then a day later on March 10th via the LA Times, I love this. Chicago forward Luol Deng will miss at least two more weeks because of a tiny yeah. stress fracture. Oh, man. Dang has had pain in the leg for more than a week. Tried to work out Monday before the Bulls visited the Heat. Dang said doctors in Miami and Chicago have determined that there is a very small, not even a hairline fracture in the leg. Whew. Yeah, if you are Luol Dang, are you like, what the hell, man? Yeah, so again, yeah. And, and, if, and if you're just reading it, this is what works with things like this, um, with wording and phrasing. Mm -hmm. And honestly, um, with with creating the 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 um, the characteristics of the story is people reading that. If I'm reading that, I'm gonna go. Oh man, man, Luol Deng, come on, man, suck it up. You just got paid eighty million dollars. And here's what one writer in Chicago wrote via the Tribune: that the Bulls were going to encourage Deng to challenge himself physically was interpreted to mean, can you believe this guy? What a wimp. <laughs> Which is true. Absolutely. Totally true. However, Rick Morrissey in that column had Luol Deng's back. He also went on to say, before he returned to action, Deng wanted to know if he would risk further injury if he laced up his shoes again. That's all. Mm -hmm. Stress fractures heal with rest. They don't respond to continuous pounding. Any long distance runner will tell you that. An 82 game NBA schedule does not offer much in the way of rest or sympathy. One million percent true, uh -huh. one million percent. So a good write up there from Rick Morrissey who it seems like was in the minority of having Luol Deng's back. Here is the second strike of where there was a disconnect between the Bulls and the Waldang, and then 
we get to why the Bulls potentially may have caused a death with Luol Deng. So in 2012, Luol Deng suffered a torn ligament in his wrist. Again, major out. That's a double out. Totally. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> it's so casual how I said it, but I just wanted to stop for a yeah. second to acknowledge that is a really, really hurtful injury. So tore a ligament in his wrist, and the Bulls were like, play through it. Play through it. You're fine. Surgery at the end of the offseason, or, or, or in the offseason. And Luol was like, well, wait a minute. My dad was granted asylum from Great Britain. I owe it to Great Britain to play for that team in the offseason. So then he wanted to put it off again because the Bulls were making him put it off uh, immediately. So this is via ESPN. This is a scouting report that somehow got leaked to the media. So the source in the scouting report goes on to talk about a uh, fissure between the team and Dang over his left wrist, which is where the torn ligament was, which he injured in a uh, January 21st, 2012 game. It states management convinced him not to get surgery until after the season. Luol did what they asked. That summer, he wanted to play for the English national team, put it off again. The source said the Bulls gave him mixed messages on playing for the team, national team, and quote, this really bothered him, close quote. The source then went on to discuss how the recent lack of contract talks bothered Dang and reiterated what Dang has said. The Bulls gave him only a take it or leave it offer, <laughs> you see this all the time, mm -hmm. before they traded him to the Cavs. So that was a little bit later on, but still, it's very important to note, he wanted to play for the English national team. Look, if you are granted, and we can't even fathom this, but if you're granted political asylum, asylum, period, mm -hmm. you escape a war-torn country where you see family members, friends, loved ones, et cetera, et cetera. Millions of people. Millions of people get killed. <clears throat> and the one thing you want to do with your own gift, your skill that you've developed to becoming one of the best in the world and having employment and the National Basketball Association is represent the country that gave you a second chance. And because think of it this way, we talked about the millions of people that died. Um, he and his family were allowed to escape partially because his father had some level of position. He was a, a, a Sudanese politician, he was in the parliament mm -hmm. uh, until 1989, as you were talking about when um, the government when was, was going out, right? Yeah. And then so he took off, kind of snuck away in the night under the veil of a vacation, right? So mm -hmm. some random kid who happened to grow to six feet, nine inches tall, and maybe could play soccer, maybe could play basketball, maybe could play something else, maybe he didn't get that chance. Maybe his parents died. Maybe he got killed because he mm. didn't have that position to get out of the country. That's a good point. His dad was a politician. Like, that's a little bit of privilege. Now, not to say that's anything bad about that. That was his chance. He was lucky. But who knows what would have happened even in that government role what would have happened to the Dang family if he stayed? Right, yeah, yeah. no, so Took he was lucky to, to get out even with the privilege he had over many other people. Correct. So after that happens, and you've seen all these people die, and the way it turns out, and the things you've escaped, you go, man, I owe it to somebody because why am I here? Mm -hmm. Why am I the one who got out, right? Mm -hmm. So you think, I owe it to them. It's a summer, it's a summer uh, a, a league or whatever. It's, it's, I'm playing Can for, the for the national team. Cool. No, that's the thing. Like You have to go into his mind as to why he felt... This loyalty. Totally. Because it's his life. Yes, exactly. And thus, the Bulls were pissed at him. Now, here's the third strike with the Chicago Bulls franchise and the Wall Day. So, do you remember those Brooklyn Nets teams with Darren Williams and yeah, Gerald Wallace? Yeah. So, the Bulls played that Gerald Brooklyn. Was a baller. <laughs> he was a baller. If, <laughs> if he didn't have like a million concussions, I still think he would be a damn, damn good player in the league. I mean, oh, how old is he now? Like 38? He probably still, it doesn't matter. We could do it later. Anyway. We could do I'll it in a separate second. No. Regardless, the Brooklyn Nets and Mikhail Prokhorov, what did he say? Don't let the door hit you while the good Lord split you. <laughs> Man, Russian billionaires. <laughs> so uh, the Brooklyn Nets faced off against the Chicago Bulls that year. Here's what occurred. Via the Associated Press, the Nets forced game seven against the Bulls. The Bulls would later win, by the way. So the Bulls stood their ground. This is via the AP, a game recap. Even though Kirk Heinrich missed a second straight game, and Luol Deng was sidelined with flu-like symptoms, forcing coach Tom Thibodeau to shuffle the lineup. They labeled this flu-like symptoms. It's not flu-like symptoms, by the way. And you're going to learn this in a moment. Here's where also the Chicago Bulls railroaded Luol Deng, and really his heart, in my opinion. When Tom Thibodeau was asked what they had, he said comically, in a comically evasive nature, a viral something, something, flu-like symptoms, whatever. 
Man, I mean, you're just throwing your player under the bus. Meanwhile, three days later, this is what happened. That looks way more like flu than flu-like symptoms, doesn't it? Mm. So May 6, Luol Deng puts this up on Instagram from the hospital. Let's go back to the third for a second. The test came back negative. Deng arrived at the United Center in hopes of playing in that playoff game, not feeling well enough to play, was sent home 90 minutes before a tip, was what Coach Thibbs said. From the hospital bed, here is what Luol Deng tweeted. There's a few of these. It really upsets me that everyone thinks I would miss a game because of the flu. I played a lot of games with the flu in my career. On Wednesday, I was taken prior to game six. Prior to game six, I was taken to the ER. My symptoms indicated I may have meningitis, which by the way, is what the Bulls thought he had. That's why they sent him. So what did they do? Come back to me real quick. They did something that is so extreme in nature and is why this is so important and why you'll learn later on why many players like Kawhi Leonard and others maybe shear away from team doctors a little bit. Because they had a spinal tap done on Luol Deng. And here were the results of the spinal tap. As a result, I suffered the worst headache I've ever experienced, been the weakest I've ever felt. Yesterday, I was unable to walk or even get out of bed. I made it to the United Center and was sent home. This morning, my symptoms worsen. If I'm medically cleared, I will fly to New York to be with my team and try to win game seven in Brooklyn. Furthermore, Dang was released from the hospital by team doctors, this was. Released from the hospital, cleared to play against the Miami Heat. Days after having a spinal tap. Dang was upset that the Bulls' team physicians accompanied the entire team to Miami for the start of the series, leaving him alone in a Chicago hospital. So what sort of support is he possibly having at this point? Here were his symptoms again. Started having severe headaches, struggling to walk, started feeling weak, throwing up, constant diarrhea. I just couldn't control my body really. Because of that, I lost a lot of weight. The final number was 15 pounds for Luol Deng. Still just trying to get back, just trying to get right because I still don't feel well. So now we get to the most important point, and then I'm gonna have JR react, which is why the hell was he cleared? Why was he cleared to play by Bulls team doctors? The entire process called into question why he was ever cleared to play, citing privacy issues. The Bulls have repeatedly declined media requests, obviously, to address Dang's condition at the time, but Dang insists it felt like the closest he's ever come to death. Well, that's the privacy issues. We don't wanna talk about it. We don't wanna. Amen it's to that. Pleading the fifth, the fifth. Uh, I don't want to talk in case it's going to incriminate me mm -hmm. because the whole time we kind of didn't care. We wanted to continue to push all the blame onto him, uh, call him a weak person, call him uh, not committed to the team. We already had these take it or leave it, as we saw eventually come up, the take it or leave it status Many times. contract with, uh, with after that. And he just doesn't want to play in these important series, this tiny flu-like symptoms. Um, by the way, I mean, I've seen it several times with athletes. I wouldn't play with the flu. They do. Right. I, maybe that's why I'm sitting here. I didn't have that same commitment <laughs> to the sport. Right. But uh, so You're trying to tell me you don't have a flu game in you? <laughs> Jesus. And after <laughs> after someone pulls a needle out of your back, and then spinal fluid is leaking throughout your body, yep, causing you to be immobile. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can go and play basketball at the highest level with the highest com competition in the playoffs. This wasn't a game against the worst team in the league. It's against Miami. Brooklyn what, first. Yeah, but then like yeah, the second series, they want to come back after the spinal tap and play. Who was yeah. on that Miami team? Do you remember that Miami team? <laughs> Dwayne Wade. <laughs> Dwayne Wade. Uh, so look, JR said that there was a leak. I'm going to get into that in a oh. moment, which is a humongous part of the story. First, from Luol Deng's perspective, near-death experience. I've never been in a situation where I was afraid for my life. That's how deep it was. The whole situation, there wasn't trust. There was miscommunication between the team and doctors. I wasn't told the proper procedure to take care of myself. It was just mishandled. I remember, this is so important, I remember my friend coming over and was like, it's a spinal leak. My friend was calling the team doctor. Chicago Bulls' is team doctor's response. I don't think so. A team doctor's response without even hearing anything else. Nope, didn't happen. And my friend told the team doctor, if you don't do something, I'm taking him to a different hospital. So I called my agent and asked for a different hospital. Absolutely. He had setbacks that ensued. Even after he had the procedure that stopped the fluid leak, which the Bulls ordered. By the way, if they don't order him to go to the hospital, none of this shit happens. Or order the spinal tap. Or order the spinal tap. Mm. None of this happens, but still here we are. Dang said more set, oh, I'm sorry, next one, please. Um, said the setbacks ensued, finally got diagnosed. Uh, 
with asthma, which was surprising. Hey, by the way, uh, you have meningitis. Uh, let's get the spinal tap. Uh, you're almost gonna die. Thank God we found out that you have asthma. I never had that in my life, Dank said. I couldn't work out for months. Most of my summer, I couldn't do anything. And then his agent, Herb Rudoy, said, we never negotiated with the Chicago Bulls that offseason. We had several meetings. One was to discuss the medical care he got or did not get after a spinal tap, which was of great concern to them. And here's what John Paxson had to say. We did not handle that as well as we could have and should have. I guess we didn't understand the gravity of it in that moment from his perspective. That's on us. But over the summer, we talked to both Lou and his agent. We apologized. That's something we dropped the ball on. Hopefully learned from it. But in terms of injuries and things like that over Lou's career, I think we've been really supportive of how he's gone about things. You think so? This is the brutal nature of the business, ladies and gentlemen. Is again, mis real quick, misdiagnosing one of your star players, him having a near-death experience because the team did not care about him. Like I, I wish that we would have a little bit more support for our players and those who are in the stands saying, I pay for your salary. Get out there and play. Shut up and dribble. No. We also have to take into account what the player is feeling. And that's what drove me crazy about Kawhi Leonard and many mm -hmm. other cases where a player would a player would pivot away from team doctors because they understand their body a little <laughs> bit more. But us as fans get on them like crazy for doing so. Team doctors are paid by uh, the team. <laughs> you know? So it's it's like we've said many times with concussions in certain sports, um, when they before really a, a, a spotlight was put on it. Their job was to make sure the guy went back out there and played. He's cleared. He's okay. Mm -hmm. Not if he's my personal doctor or if he's my personal patient and I'm actually coming to see him. He came in. He's a multimillionaire. He's like, hey, doc, I heard you're good at this. I'm going to be your patient for years to come. And this doctor will go, I better be really good to this guy because mm -hmm. he pays my salary. Mm -hmm. And he's and his success in his in his field will continue to make him millions and millions of dollars, which will continue to make me tons of money. So that's where their loyalty lies, is who's paying them. Yeah, they're still doctors. Yeah, they still know what they're doing. But I feel like in many cases, I'm not going to sweep all team doctors because I don't know any of them. But there's a certain a, a certain level of care that you push. Like, he can go to this point. Instead of fully healthy, he can do okay here because I still have to answer to the team and I still don't want this player to crumble. Mm -hmm. Not yet, at least, because mm -hmm. we still need him to play. So think about this. Derrick Rose was on the, uh, that team, too. Mm -hmm. I remember all those uh, knee problems and then there was a point when he didn't want to do surgery because he said he'd like to walk again or play with his kids or something when he's 40 years old. Right. And people were like, that was when I believe you? he was, was he with the Knicks at that point when he said that? Or was it the later stage? It was the later stage of the yeah. Bulls. No, you're right. But it was right. multiple it was knee things, and they were like, how does this guy not play? And I was yeah. like, I was like, well, I remember when it was happening. I said, man, it's frustrating because I remember how explosive Derrick Rose was. Yeah. And I was like, I love seeing that, but I don't know what his knee feels like. Mm -hmm. Playing with your children sounds like a great thing. <laughs> to does. sit out this season and make sure and still come back and be right mm -hmm. is most important. But that's not that's not where they're uh that's not where their interests lie. The funny thing is, not that we would ever get them on the record for this because they'd never say it, but behind closed doors, I would assume that doctors would say, no, I diagnosed him correctly. He yeah. has to go play. Yeah. It's on him. He's being selfish. Look at this selfish, petulant little athlete right here. That would likely be their response. Even John Paxson in his apology said, um, it's something that hopefully we'll learn from. Hey, how about we're going to learn from this? Yeah, amen to that. The lasting image, I know we have this picture right here, and it is of Luol Deng in a Cleveland Cavaliers uniform. He would go to the Miami Heat. He would get paid by the Los Angeles Lakers. And by the way, that was when the CBA was outrageous, when everyone was getting paid, and Tyler Johnson got like $56 million. We all know he's not worth it. No offense, but like we all know that he's not worth it. He is now with the Minnesota Timberwolves, yeah. to zero surprise. The main point of this story is, Whenever athletes are giving you those tiny little insights, with the Kawhi Leonard scan, even with uh, the Philadelphia 76ers, as they've misdiagnosed players in the past, listen to the players a little bit more. And hopefully, more organizations could learn from this because you do not want to have this. Imagine if the spinal tap yeah. was given 
and it actually resulted in death. The worst case scenario was that close to happening because of a misdiagnosis from the team. And if that did happen, we're not really sure we would have gotten that story either. True, very true. All righty, we are done here. We appreciate everybody watching, listening, subscribing, commenting, giving us a thumbs up. If you hate us or the Bulls or Lou Aldang for whatever reason, giving it a thumbs down. We really don't care. It's a free country. All that matters is that you guys are watching, which we appreciate. We'll see you next time. Do you guys want full TYT episodes? Yeah. So download YouTube TV and get a seven-day free week trial.